Welcome to Azure Databricks, a brief introduction. My name is Brian Kafke. I'm a technical solutions professional with Microsoft. And I do want to call your attention to a couple of links. The most important one is the one in GitHub. So github.com slash bkafferkey slash shared will give you not only the content for this particular presentation, but also the content for all the different things I do. So have at it. It's good content out there, riveting stuff. And the link below that is uh, to allow you to schedule yourself to attend a webinar I'll be doing, which will be a much more in-depth presentation on Databricks, about an hour long. This one should be hopefully 20 minutes if I can keep it down and not get into all the exciting details. But uh, if you go there, you can go to meetup.com. And if you find the slides, I'll make sure you can click the link, but just look for the Rhode Island Microsoft BI user group. I just need people to go through that so that I can send them the information of how to get into the webinar and can kind of manage the, the size of the webinar so I don't hit any kind of resource constraints. So this slide is really meant to give you a very high level idea of what Databricks is all about. The hottest big data platform out there is Spark. And I'll talk a little bit more about why Spark is so hot and so cool. But knowing that, what Databricks is, I'll start by saying that the founder, one of the founders of Databricks, was the writer of Spark, came up with Spark. So it makes sense that Databricks is going to be related to Spark and in fact, Databricks is really uh, a sort of portal or a wrapper around Spark to enable business users or enterprise people to get a lot of benefit out of Spark easily, seamlessly, point and click kind of stuff, make it really a nice environment. And for that reason, I think Databricks and Microsoft make a lot of sense together because Microsoft is all about wizards and ease of use and nice GUIs that allow you to get work done without having to get bogged down into like configurations and details that, that kind of really are great if you want to be an administrator, but not so great if you're trying to get a business task done. So at the center of this, you can see Spark, which is meant to be supporting big data. And the symbol to the right of that, the beaker, is meant to represent machine learning. So that tells you Databricks is meant to be a machine learning collaborative environment based on Spark. In a nutshell, that's what it is. What it does, though, why not just use Spark? Spark's awesome, it's powerful, you can do a lot without it. True, but not all of Spark is easy to use, especially for end users. If, you're, if your job is to be a researcher trying to find a cure for cancer, you may not want to get into the details of building out clusters and figuring out what hardware you have, etc. And that's where uh, Databricks comes in. Databricks is adding on to that the ability to point and click, create scalable clusters, and I'll talk a little bit about clusters, but the bottom thing in a nutshell is a cluster is a set of machines that are going to support your process to scale out. So you can do that. Security, so Active Directory. Now this is the Azure benefit, Active Directory integration, role-based security, et cetera, is all behind there. So you can work with data if you're in healthcare, which is the area I focus on, you're doing banking, finance. You know, it's like keeping your data secure is critical. Azure is the best place to do that, I think. But with Databricks and integration with Azure, you get all of that security and integration, but you still get the benefit of Spark and the, and the scalability and Databricks. Another thing that adds is scheduling. So a lot of times you may be building this machine learning model and maybe in testing you can do like subsets of data, but now you need to do the real deal. Maybe you want to schedule it to run over a weekend, you know, kick it off at 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning and let it run over the weekend, or maybe kick it off at night, run it overnight. You don't want to have to wait, you know, physically at your machine until eight o'clock and run it or have to worry about logging in and kicking off something. So you have a scheduler, you can set up a schedule and have things run on a regular basis. Maybe you want to refresh a model, rebuild it every, every few days or every week, and then have new data coming in get scored from your models. So again, this is all stuff that you can operationalize within Databricks. Notebooks is the thing I'll talk about, but uh, there's a proprietary notebook specific to Databricks, which is really cool. Very familiar to anyone who's done notebooks like Jupyter Notebooks, but some features to it that are, I think, nicer. And the fact is that the languages support are the ones supported by Spark. So the SQL that Spark has, the ability to bring things in like MLI, but also Python, R, etc. you can do right within this. And finally, collaboration. Spark is an awesome big data platform, but how do we collaborate with our work? How do we make sure that the data engineer, the data scientist, maybe the research manager or project leads all can properly participate in this environment in a secured way? Maybe you don't want the data engineer mucking with notebooks, but you do want them to be able to create clusters and vice versa. That's where the collaboration comes in. Databricks is designed to really ideally let you collaborate and everything. And then within the overall security architecture, you can really manage that well. 
So that's really the idea, a big scale, Spark-based machine learning collaborative environment. That's really what we're talking about here. And this can support dashboards and streaming and all kinds of other stuff. Why Spark? Well, I touched on a little bit, but Spark is the latest, greatest, hot, big data environment. It has a lot of flexibility, a lot of extensibility. It's faster than Hadoop. It says up here, you know, my slide here, but 100 times faster than Hadoop. I can believe that to a point because Hadoop is written is basically writing in and out to disk storage, which is going to take a while. And if you know memory, obviously, is a lot faster. So with Spark, it's doing everything in memory. They call them resilient distributed data sets, I believe. And the idea there is, like Hadoop, it, it's good at like if fault tolerance and recovery. It's got all that ability, but it's all in memory, so it's super fast. So that's that's really where you get the the benefits. And it's you know can support for Scala, which is really its language, Java, Python, R, and we'll see you know Spark SQL graphics, all that kind of stuff. I like this picture just because me it gives me a mental grasp. This is Spark. Okay, this is what you get without even having Databricks. So Spark is a great thing too. If I told you nothing else, if you decide you don't like Databricks, okay, but you do want Spark. It's very cool. <laughs> and I don't know when I set down Databricks. It's all awesome. But uh, Spark is really a great tool in of itself, and it supports a lot of things. And I think that most enterprises who want to take big data seriously and want to do machine learning are going to have to look at Spark. So it's it's open source. You've got I love the way it's designed. It's, it's flexibility of architecture. I, I played with Hadoop early. To be honest, I found it really difficult to work with. Not into writing Java stuff, but here I can go in with Spark and use SQL. I love SQL. It's great. It's perfect for manipulating data. So it's great. I can use that right in Spark, built-in support. If I want to scale up my machine learning models, I can use from the open source. I can go to the ML Lib instead and create very scalable logistic models, classification models. You know whatever I'm trying to do. Spark streaming. So if you got heavy duty streaming, you want to do things like IoT, you know, that kind of stuff, you can stream to Spark. And you can use native Spark streaming or you can use Kafka and other things. You also have a graphics library, again, a scalable one. I want to do now a pie chart or whatever, you know, histogram, but I've got a trillion records coming in. Open source libraries probably aren't going to handle that too well. But using the graphics library, I can do things like that. So again, and that's your kind of core engine. And then underneath the covers is the flexibility to have, like, if you like, you don't want to have Spark manager clusters. You want to have some flexibility, let Yarn or Mesos do that. You can swap that out and that can happen. So it's designed with a lot of extensibility and flexibility in mind. And I think that's really one of the reasons it's a popular platform. So there's a lot of great books on Spark. And I have to say, it does help if you're going to use Databricks to know, uh, know Spark because it's built on that. Now, some things that Databricks is adding to Spark is the idea you have a lot of security control, access control. So I really like. So workspace is something that's sort of your container for your notebooks, and you can secure that. You can secure who can create and maintain your clusters, job access control, and there's also a REST API to call externally to do things, create things, query things. So all this stuff can be secured. And it's kind of the artifacts that you get within Databricks. I'll start on the left. Well, I'll start at the top because the big thing is, of course, you're storing your data in clusters. You're gonna it's in memory, remember, but you're gonna spin out to a bunch of machines. So let me roll back for a minute and say, what are we talking about when we talk about a cluster? Well, the idea of scaling out is simple. We want to take a task that's really big, and we want to, instead of trying to have one machine do it all, then instead of scaling up, they would call that, make it a bigger machine, more memory, there's a limit you hit. You start to hit the ceiling. Instead, we'll scale out. We'll just use a lot of machines to do the work. So to equate that to sort of a human task, imagine I have a phone book, and I want you to tell me every person in the phone book with the letter A and the third letter of their name. Well, what if I took that, instead of just giving it to you and you go through this entire phone book and I wait for that, what if I took it and I split it up by last name and the letter in the last name that it starts with. So all the A's, all the letter, last names that start with A go to this person, all the ones with B's, C's, D's, and then I say now's do the search. Well, I've made the task a lot smaller for any person doing the search, so I would expect it's going to be a lot faster, right? And then at the end, I take what you gave me. You gave me two names. You gave me three. You gave me five, and I put it all together. I'm the cluster manager, right? I'm the one that's the cluster that's pulling together all these nodes. You would be a node if you're dealing with one letter. And that's kind of the idea. You're orchestrating this work it's like a big, uh, big project where everyone's taking a piece. So it scales. And the nice thing about this is it scales very well, even if you get into massive data sets. Little tidbit too. By using that last name metaphor, you can that's called partitioning. So I'd be spreading that data partitioning, and there's a lot of strategies and how things get partitioned. But you'll notice that 
a good chance that someone whose last name starts with a letter like X will say, probably not a lot of them, whereas people whose last name starts with, say, M, probably a lot. So when you do this kind of uh, splitting up and cluster or partitioning like that, bear in mind that there is a you want to try to get the most even level of partitions possible. Last name in that case wouldn't be a bad way to go, but in a lot of data sets you have to be careful because you don't want to skew it one way so that one or two nodes are doing most of the work. Okay, so we can see artifacts here. We have libraries, which is just if I want to import Python or R libraries, I can do that. Jobs, we talked about. Workspaces contain my notebook. So those are the artifacts. And this slide's really meant to show under prep and train, you can see Azure Databricks. The idea there is really just that you, it can both ingest and outgest, if that's a word. It can write to different places like Azure Cosmos or SQL Data Warehouse or SQL DB. It can do all these things. So you might have data coming in that you want to use and create predictive models. You then may want to pull other sources in and score those, the new data coming in or whatever. And it can do all that stuff. And you can, of course, use Power BI and things with it to visualize and external tools. So it fits into the kind of overall ecosystem. And because it is such big scale, it can do ETL type work. Uh, and it can do a lot of processing and moving data around. Azure Data Factory is really the central ETL engine for Azure, but Databricks is capable of doing a lot too. And if it fits into sort of the workflow of your machine learning, it might be a good thing to include. I'm going to pop up over here, getting a little sluggishness here. And when you get into the Azure portal, you can see I've got it already here, but let me go to my dashboard for a minute and pretend I'm starting fresh. And what I want to do is I'm going to create a new resource. So if you're starting fresh and you want to try to play around with Databricks, you can go to create a resource. And a nice thing, of course, in Azure is I can just search for what I want. So I'm looking for Azure Databricks. And it comes up. There it is. And by the way, Postgres is now there as a service too, as is MySQL. Very cool. Um, and I can say I want to create my service. So what I'm doing is I'm creating, provisioning really, the Azure Databricks service within Azure. And it's a first-class service, meaning once it's there, it's a complete platform as a service. I just use it and everything else. I don't have to really do much deal with it. I don't have to go separately to Databricks to license it. Databricks is a separate company. It's a separate process altogether, but the service is completely integrated. So you just use it as if it was a native Azure service. So I can give it my name here. Uh, and you could say resource groups. Now, underneath the covers, you need a resource group. It's going to tend to be a container for your resources. But I also want to point out here, too, that compute is separate from storage, which is really critical because the real price side of this is going to be your clusters. And the clusters is your compute engine, and you know, you're dealing with a lot of resources. So that's where you're going to have to pay more money. But your storage is cheap, right? And in the end, depending on what you're doing, it's pretty cheap, and it's storing it in blob storage or whatever. So your notebooks, the data you bring in, et cetera, that you're storing to disk, you persist. It's retained. The clusters can be shut down and turned off and have no effect on that, which is really great. And your cost is like minimal as long as you watch the, the amount of time you're running the actual clusters. So the clusters are great, um, but you don't need to run them all the time. And I'll show you lots of ways that you can make that the most efficient thing possible. But even me, who love to create things in Azure, as anyone who knows me in Microsoft will probably attest to, uh, have been really lucky with that with the Databricks because I set it to automatically turn my clusters off when I'm not using them. And you can too. So let's take a look at um, this. I'm not going to create a cluster here because I think they know I've created enough things in Azure already. And even Microsoft has limits, but I won't do that right now. I'm going to go to my dashboard and pull in my Databricks demo cluster I've got. And I do want to point out like all these you know, resources, OK? here. You know, don't just bypass them. Sure, jump in and play around, but uh, bear in mind there's, there's lots of great documentation on Azure Databricks. Take advantage of it. You can get jump started on things. There's sample notebooks you can play with. Great way to jump in and get going. I'm just going to launch my workspace. and then Watch the magic here because it's taking me and passing me through to the Azure Databricks portal, essentially. It's already authenticated me. It knows who I am. It knows what I can do, what I can't do. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side this whole thing here. This is really, this to me feels like a whole nother portal. And it reminds me actually a lot of the Azure portal because I've got all my actions here. And then in here, I've got my, my sort of blade or my workspace. And you can see when you first come in, it's giving you all kinds of, again, documentations. I want to do a new notebook. I want to do these things, documentation on things. These are things I've recently used. So let me start at the core of what Databricks is all about, which is the cluster. All right, so I'm going to go over here, cluster. And you can see this green button here tells me I'm running a cluster. It is a standard cluster. This other one I had is serverless. 
it says a standard too, but it's actually a serverless one. And a serverless cluster is a platform as a service serverless. It kind of takes that whole path to another level where you don't even think about the cluster at all. It just takes care of it. So let me just demo creating a cluster. I won't actually create one, but I'll just say I'm creating a cluster here. Uh, I can tell it what type of you know, runtime versions I want. So if I want to be on an older version, I can do that or go to the latest. Now I, I'm creating a standard by default, but if I go to the serverless, I can create serverless. And when I create a serverless cluster, I can't use Scala. That's one of the limitations. So the Scala language is really the uh, the language of Spark. And when I create a serverless pool, as it calls it here, you can see it says, like, and it's in beta, so it's not quite there yet uh, for production, but you get R, Python, and SQL. Those are your, that's the way you can work with it. But if I do a standard, I can also work with Scala. So that's the biggest difference. Uh, also, my versions here and Python. So Python has two different incompatible versions. 3.x is the latest, greatest. That's what's supported. 2.7 and earlier is now deprecated and people aren't supposed to really be using it anymore. They're not going to be adding any new features. Everything now is going to the 3 whatever, 3.x. Uh, I can pick my driver varies like this type of stuff, what I want for driver. I take pretty much the cheapest. And the nice thing here is I can pick the number of workers. So I've got this cluster and I've got I'm managing a bunch of nodes and each node is a worker essentially. So it's going to be doing work. And I can say I want two to you know, 2,000, whatever I want to be in my cluster. So a cluster is really think of it as sort of a, a tribe of things working or something. You've got this parent over here managing it, the cluster manager, and all these workers just working on your task. So I'm not going to need, I don't really need it for my stuff that I'm demoing. Now this is really cool too. I can automatically by default clusters will terminate after 120 minutes. So you can play around with it and after two hours they'll terminate. You can set that to whatever you want. So if I know I'm just going to work with it say during a day and I want it to definitely not be on that night and keep it on, I can just have it automatically terminate which is a really nice thing. You can also do some tagging. Tagging is good if you want to have people who are querying the resources they can look at tags like this is production, it's not. So they kind of a way to give extra information to this. Put it across Azure and almost anything I can think of as a resource. And in my automation stuff, I talk a lot more about tags. All right, so this is how I'd create a cluster. I, mean, I don't need to create a cluster here, but that's the big thing. Um, so I've got a cluster here that I want to use. So let's talk, well, I'll play, explain the stop back. I have some data in here, but I'll show you how one way you can bring up data. So I want to bring up some data and I've got some data imported here into what they call tables. So it's kind of like importing data into a SQL Server table or something. You import it, and then it creates a structure around it. But again, this is going to be all in memory. But what I'm going to do here, I'm going to say, OK, create a new table. And I can upload a file, which of course isn't going to be really big data. Uh, DBFS is sort of a wrapper around a blob storage account or blob storage. So you can do that if I had DBFS, I had something stored. Or I can do Spark data sources. So I'm going to say upload a file. Click here to upload a file. I'll do this birth weight CSV thing. I notice it uploaded it here. And I'm going to say create a table with the UI. And I got to tell it what cluster I want it to go to. Preview the table. And I'm going to say uh, birth weight 2, because I already have one out there with that. If I say first row is in the header, or has the headers, then it's kind of like tells you, oh yeah, it gave me now column names, so I don't have to name everything. And I can change the types as I see fit. And finally, I can say create the table. Now, I want to give you a little warning if you do this. I had an error in a previous demo I did, and that's because the file, the table already existed. I tried to use the same name, and it wasn't terribly intuitive about that error. So be careful. If you have that happen, just make sure you don't already have something there. Okay, so I now have birth weight 2 or birth WT2, and my data is out there, and it's quite riveting. So now you can see that's all it takes to bring data in. But again, you have DBFS, which is again a wrapper. It's a it's a way you can interact, kind of like treating it. DBFS will treat it sort of like the operating system, like a file you can just bring in. It's a nice integration point with blob storage. So again, kind of a value added there. So let's go to workspaces. This is where the real stuff happens. I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go into users. Again, lots of documentation. These are some notebooks I have. Go to users. I'm going to go here, and this could be many different people, and you can manage the users and all that good stuff. I'm going to go to birth weight analysis, and the first thing I want to kind of do here, and I've got some errors because I've got some pieces in my code that are wrong, so don't worry about that. It's just telling me it doesn't like some things. Uh, first thing I want to do, though, I'm in a notebook, so let me talk about notebooks for a minute. 
first thing about a notebook, if you use Jupyter or whatever, you know that this cells. And I go in here, and each cell, most cells are going to be code, but some cells are just for documentation. And we call those cells markdown cells. And you see, percent MD means this is a markdown cell. So typically a cell is going to have a percent and some letters after it to tell it what type of cell this is. It would you know, kind of be of a certain type. It's a Python notebook, and you don't have to tell it unless you're trying to do something very different. But these, these are Spock notebooks that are specific to Databricks, and so they support the types of cells that Spark supports as a rule. So Markdown is, well, that's actually a, not a Spark thing. It's just to attribution, so uh, sort of annotations. And what Markdown is is it's a markup of a markup. So HTML is a markup language, and Markdown is sort of a markup of that because if I want an H1 tag, I just put a little uh, pound sign. Two pounds is an H2. Three pounds is an HT. Eight, uh, three pounds is uh, H3. You can do bullet points. You can do all this stuff. And if I go over here, you can even see that it supports HTML syntax and CSS. So I can format things. And the purpose of these markdown cells, by the way, if I want to run this, I can do shift enter. Or I can go over here and I can, you know, kind of navigate things. But uh, yeah, so I can run it with shift enter. And you can see you've got CSS and HTML. And let me go over here because I did want to kind of show this for a minute. I can copy cells, add cells, and do all kinds of manipulation around here. I can sort of expand or contract. There really is nothing to run in that case, but if I was in a cell like this, then I can do, oh, here, right here I can say run the cell. I can run cell above or below and all that good stuff. Okay, so these are, the, the ones that show annotations are just markdown cells. This is a Python cell. Can run it and you can see all that really did is tell me Python version and over here again each cell is going to say what you can run here or you can move things around and do things with the managing of your cells etc this is a SQL cell so it presents SQL and it lists the tables I did you can see the new one I just loaded a table this one's nice I can run this percent SQL and it's pulling in the birth weight table, not the one we just loaded, but a previous version of the same thing. And I can go in here and I can do some cool stuff. I can say, oh, I don't want a bar chart of that. Isn't that pretty? Or I can do a scatter chart. No, that doesn't look good. Uh, I can do a histogram. And I can also, you know, drag and resize that. I don't have to take what's there. So this this plot options thing gives me a lot of flexibility. It's one of the things I really like about these notebooks. And I can go in here and really play with the options for plots, display types, and all this stuff. And, what types of aggregation I want. So a lot of flexibility. Now you can still use your, you know, with Python, you can use PySpark interface. And so you can do your Python stuff if you like. If you want to do things like ggplot2 with R, you can do that as well. You'll see there's a display statement though. So at the end of when you're doing those types of functions to do graphics, you just need to put display around it and output the what you want in terms of the output to go to the grid. Okay, and this is another select kind of statement. All right, so we can see SQL, this dbutils. You'll see dbutils periodically, and usually when you see it, it's these are widgets, so you can see it allows you to create like widgets within the notebook, and I'll show you those in a second. But widgets are just ways to add parameters that you can use to kind of control your visualizations. Here I can see, you can see percent %r, and I can run code there and create data frames and all kinds of stuff like that. So a lot of good stuff. If you get errors, one thing I'd purposely have this in here, notice it will give you many times a lot of detail about the error. So it's kind of nice that you can see here, it's, it's saying it can't find the file, but that's the idea here. And you can do you know, all kinds of different visualizations, good stuff here, again, more Python. And really my whole point, and when I do create here, you see it's creating all this stuff. It's the display thing here that finally says, show me this. So I'm creating a figure and displaying it. And that's the key thing there. All right, so we've looked at all that. We've seen our notebooks. We know we can support Python R. Uh, we can use SQL. We can use Scalar, except in the serverless pools. Uh, we attach over here. So we might have multiple clusters. We attach it here. If you're not attached, it will prompt you to say, you need to attach your notebook to a cluster. Otherwise, you can't do anything. Files, I can clone, copy, rename, all this kind of good stuff here. Delete, export. So it's kind of managing my file. View code, I can say I only want to see results, or I want to see the code, I want to hide line numbers, all these different options, okay? I can set permissions, so I can say, you know, what users can do what. I don't have any other people in my little area, but if I did, I could control things like that. 
Here I can say run the entire notebook. I can clear out just parts of my notebook here. And what if I want to schedule it? I can schedule here and say, oh, I want to do a new schedule. And then I can do every day, every hour. And you see all these options to schedule my work. Comments are here. And I can even do like revision history will show here. And this does integrate with GitHub. So I can integrate what's going on here with GitHub. All right. All right. Let me go back here for a minute. I think I kind of lost my place. All right. Let me see if I got everything here. Okay. Oh, I have to get rid of revisions. When you're in revisions, it does stop you from doing some edits and things. So you do have to be kind of careful about some of it. And it's an interesting thing that you'll sometimes see it pops up. If I want to insert a new cell, I can do that by highlighting it. it. Let's me put in a new cell. So we've seen the major pieces here. The other thing I can do is uh, by going to view code, I can also do dashboard. So I can say I want to create a new dashboard, but I'm just going to show you one I already created, Mega, Mega Corp, whatever. Kind of like a Warner Brothers name, Mega Corp. But you can see it's got all the different pieces of my notebook, and I can kind of control what goes where, all that good stuff. So this is really great if I want to build a notebook that I want to use maybe for streaming dashboard or some other piece. I can do that right here. It gives me a lot of flexibility, so it's really kind of a cool feature. Again, you get a lot of things. So Now, I'm not going to get into other notebooks, but there's lots of different things. Um, maybe I can see one of these. Uh, healthcare, see if that works. You can just see a lot of different visualizations, a lot of possibilities here. This is a really great one that will actually do a map graphics. I don't know if I'm showing it here somewhere, but there's one that actually does a nice job of, you know, U.S. map or world map, and it shows you, say, it could be like sales by world regions, et cetera. So that's really cool. So we've done data. We've looked at the overall entry point here. Workspaces, again, it's collections of where we collect our notebooks, et cetera. We can control everything. If I go over on my name, you can see I can also do the admin console, manage my account, etc. So I've got things going on there. Yeah, I think that's most of what's in here. If I want to search for things, I can do that here and just stop looking for resources. Jobs come up like this. If I want to look at my jobs, I can do that. And one thing, too, just so you're aware, if you've used Spark, you know that Spark also has its own sort of built-in console. And I can get to that just by going over here and highlighting it or bring stuff in. Looks like it might take a second for it to come back. But it's kind of cool because you get that integration. So if you're used to, like, you want to get behind the scenes, the one thing I would be aware of with with uh, Databricks is sometimes it kind of hides things. Like, notice it goes away, and then I go over here, and I can see things pop up. And even things like here stopping and starting clusters here, I can induce permissions. So you do have to be aware. of some. That was a little something that took me a little getting used to. Uh, but it's really cool. It's all there. It's just you got to be aware it does this sort of auto-highlighting. Right, so wrapping up, I think we've talked a lot of, about all the features. I think the key thing about Azure Databricks is you get a very powerful, collaborative, data science, big data environment to work in contained within Azure. And the integration and everything of it makes it a, a, a great platform as a service, software as a service environment that you don't have to worry about managing anything and what might happen. And the key thing also is managing yourself the clusters can automatically turn themselves off and you can set timers and things so it's a good way to manage like you know use the resources when you need them but make sure you manage them also so that when you don't need them you're not paying for uh, for the compute because you don't need it and again the separation a big takeaway if you remember nothing else is that the compute and storage are really separate so even when you don't when you don't need the clusters remember it's not really persisting it's all in memory right so if you don't need those clusters Turn them off, and you're not going to lose anything. You, your notebooks, everything stay around, so that's great. So that's the big takeaway. I, I mentioned, go again, go get the slides on github.com. Again, github.com slash bcafq slash shared. Find my thing here, and if you're really interested more, please come on. Uh, register to just on the link so you want to be part of the uh, webinar I'm coming up. It's on April 2nd, I believe. The link is in there. And uh, it'll be great because I'm going to be doing a, like an hour-long, more in-depth presentation on this, and it'll be an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you.